real pleasure for me to be to talk on this conference, which happens to be my favorite conference. Um, again, in, uh, from another perspective now, I want to make two remarks before I start. The first remark is I'm not going to talk about digital, not so much about post-digital as well. Um, for me, the, the term post-digital is really important because it, um, I think it focuses on something which I consider much more important in digital transformation than the term digital, which is like focusing on how to embrace the digital change um, in a museum mission as a whole, which means basically um, refocusing on the social aspects of it. And the other remark I want to make is there is a lot of museum colleagues from Jewish museums. And um, for me, it's the first time that I'm speaking on, on an international conference where there are so many Jewish museum colleagues, um, which I find really nice. And so my talk is a bit dedicated to you. Um, so this is um, the, the Jewish Museum Frankfurt. Um, the Jewish Museum Frankfurt happens to be the first Jewish museum in um, Germany that opened after the Holocaust in 1988. It has two locations. Both locations are shaped by the history, the Jewish history that took place at the site. One um, location is the Mu uh, Museum Judengasse, which you see on the left-hand side. It was, um, there was the former Jewish ghetto, which happens to be the first Jewish ghetto of Europe. And the other one is the Rothschild Palais. Frankfurt is the birth town of the Rothschild family. And um, it happened to be a, um, one of the palais of the Rothschild family. So in these two sites, this is the Jewish Museum. We do diverse activities beside um, what is happening at these two sites throughout the city and online. And I'm going to give you a brief introduction to what we are doing. Um, first, a movie. In 1460, the Frankfurt Town Council decided to resettle the Jewish population to a segregated area. The first Jewish ghetto in Europe, as it was later referred to, was established. At first, only a few families lived in the narrow lane along the old town wall, but their number gradually increased over the years. In the 17th century, roughly 3,000 people lived here. Frankfurt's Judengasse became an epicenter of Jewish life in Europe. 300 years later, the foundation walls of this lane were discovered when constructing an office building. After a public outcry, a museum was set up showing some of the finds. In 2016, this museum was given a new look. The entrance is now directly next to the old Jewish cemetery in Batonstrasse. In the exhibition, you can see valuable objects alongside the archaeological finds and experience how Jews once lived in Frankfurt. We look forward to your visit. Um, so, the Museum Judengasse uh, reopened in March last year as the first step of our um, renewal process. Um, and uh, so we have a new permanent or core exhibition on site, which includes the presentation of objects that were either produced or used on site, on the site of the former Judengasse, in the ruins of the former Jewish ghettos. Um, of course, um, there is digital applications included, like the movie you just saw. It's included in this installation at the beginning of the museum. Um, we have an app that leads you through the, through the museum and the Jewish cemetery that is situated right beside the building. Um, for us, it's really important that we are a, a family museum or a children's museum, so we do a lot of activities around uh, children, and um, we have an own catalog that leads children through the museum, and we have about 10 interactive displays within the exhibition, hands-on displays um, for children. Um, these are a few exhibition views. And um, this is what you already saw in the movie, and which is really important for us as a Jewish museum. Um, we um, own our very existence to the fact that there were fierce protests in the 80s, um, because when the municipal building, the administrative building was 
build on site, um, they found the ruins of the former Judengasse, and it's due to the protest that took place on the site that actually there is a museum now, because the city initially wanted to erase all the traces. And we are presenting this conflict right at the entrance of the, of the exhibition to emphasize the fact that this is a, contest, a site of contested memory and that we um, own our very existence to this process. And we also place at the very beginning the fragments of what is left of Jewish life on that side, which are the fragments of the Bernaplatz synagogue, which happened to be one of the mo proudest and most beautiful synagogues of Frankfurt. Um, right in front of the building, that's what I already mentioned, is the, is the old Jewish cemetery. It ba dates back to 1272, so it's the second oldest cemetery north of the Alps. Um, and, um, and there is a memorial site right in front of the museum as well, um, reflecting on um, the Jews that were deported and murdered from Frankfurt. Um, so what we did actually, um, we included, um, we changed the entrance so that when the visitors come in, this is what they see first. And so they first see that this is a historical site. Um, of course, we had a lot of, um, along with the opening, um, we have a new website just for Museum Judengasse. Um, we do a lot of social media activities um, like um, social meetups and, and uh, so on. And we created new event formats. Um, so part of our events is doing lectures in the ruins or making concerts. Um, we also do tours, flashlight tours um, through the cemetery at night. And um, we do dinners um, where we offer the people the, the taste of the Rothschild, so to say. So we cook um, old recipes and work with old, um, um, how do you say that, ingredients of old recipes and serve that. Um, so this is the main task that we are opening on now. Um, this is our new museum. It's supposed to reopen in 2019. And uh, right now there is a big hoarding outside and we have a project which is a comic project every two weeks. There is like a quite known comic artist from Frankfurt and he is commenting on the construction process, on the hoarding. Here you see putting the, the, the plants on the hoarding. And these um, strips, they are published in the newspaper every two weeks of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and online, of course. Um, so this is how the construction site looks now. This is how, how the historical Rothschild Palais looks like right now. And we post once in a while. We post how it looks, and um, my colleague Kubinian, who sits over here, just did a short movie of the, on the construction side, which you can see on our YouTube channel. So there is, when you are constructing, there is a lot of ceremonies, at least in Germany. So this was the breaking ground ceremony. There is the laying of the foundation stone. There is going to be a next ceremony once we finish the building, and it's always a lot of press attention. Um, this is how the new building is supposed to look like once you enter. And um, it's going to double the size of the museum. It's going to have new spaces for changing exhibitions, for, for events, for the family Frank Center. Frankfurt happens to be the place where Anne Frank was born, and we got all the family belongings. And we're going to exhibit that in the new um, permanent exhibition. And um, there is um, a museum shop and a museum cafe in the new building. And this is the library um, where you can come and also have a look into um, the, the documents and the letters that goes along with the family Frank Center. So we are not the only Jewish museum in Germany which is currently a sort of reinventing itself. The Jewish Museum Berlin, where there is a lot of colleagues here as well, um, they are happening to do a permanent, new permanent exhibition as well, and they're going to open a, a new children's museum where, where you see a draft over here. There is another Jewish museum in Frankfurt, Franken, which did an extension building and is supposed to open next year. And there is this major new museum coming up in Cologne, a new Jewish museum at the site where the oldest traces of Jewish history in Germany were being found, and that's right at the center in front of the mayor. So these are the major renewal processes of Jewish museums in Germany, but 
there is other Jewish museums in Europe um, which happen to transform themselves as well. This is the Jewish Museum of Brussels, um, which is currently closed and gonna reopen in a completely new form. This is a, a Jewish museum, and I saw that there is colleagues from, from that, which is supposed, from that museum, the Lost Städtel Museum, which is supposed to open in Lithuania, um, not far from here. This is um, the old Jewish um, <clears throat> synagogue in Stockholm, which is supposed to host the Jewish Museum of Sh uh, Stockholm. And this is um, supposed to be the new Federal National Jewish Museum of Italy. All of these, all of these renewal uh, processes and new museums are major institutions, most of them federal institutions. So something is going on. Um, as uh, Sepp has already uh, mentioned, transformation, transformation processes um, are leading to a lot of core questions. And for Jewish museums, of course, they are leading to the question, what is a Jewish museum meant to be? Is it a community museum? Is it a minority museum? Is it an identity museum? Is it a tolerance center? Is it a cultural history museum? Is it a memorial site? Well, my suggestion is, not to answer the question just by one. Um, I think we are quite hybrid institutions, and it should, these questions should be answered site-specific um, and, and should be you know, a combination of at least two aspects. Well, that's my, my opinion. Um, transformation processes of Jewish museums reflect to the question, what is the current climate of Jewish life in Europe? Jewish life in Europe always used to be conceived as the third pillar of Jewish life between Israel and the states. But we happen to have a lot of um, anti-Semitic incidents and attacks in the last years. And um, this is just, I'm, sure, I'm giving you a picture um, um, of something that happened at our museum on Friday, an another threat that we got. So it's something we are dealing with on a constant basis, a, a growing feeling of insecurity and a question of um, where is this all going to lead to? Because we know from history that whenever there is a political change, it's going to have an impact upon Jewish life. And I think the other really um, fierce question and demanding question is that we sort of need to engage with new audiences. And these new audiences have a diverse cultural background. And we need to ask ourselves, what might they be interested in? And I think a crucial question, at least for Germany, is to um, how to reach out to an audience with a, with a migration background and, let's say, a Muslim cultural background. I think this is a crucial question for Jewish museum, at least in Germany. <clears throat> so, and this is beyond Jewish Museum. Uh, transformation processes are leading to new mission statements. We got, just got to know the new mission statement of the ACME. Um, they are leading, naturally leading to changes in organizational structures. They include new leadership models. And they include interdisciplinary teamwork, which I feel is very healthy for a museum. And they should include, I'm pretty much repeating what Sepp just said, <laughs> collaboration with other institutions. Um, I think also outside of the museum world. So I think those steps are like symptomatic and crucial for transformation processes. Um, they should be leading to, because that's my conviction, what should be core to a transformation process are the audiences you are already reaching out to and you want to reach out used to. So they should, every transformation process from my perspective should include intensive audience research. Um, who are the visitors? Why do they come? What are they interested in? Um, to whom do they listen? What did they do before? How much time do they have? What are they seeking? All those kind of questions. And don't forget, there is like the majority um, of um, the people in your town is not visiting your museum. So why don't they visit your museum? Why? Um, I think this is a crucial question um, um, for the whole procedure of reaching out and redefining uh, your mission, um, to also consider the non-visitors. 
Um, this is, um, who is in the audience familiar with design thinking? Okay, so, there's, so I'm just going to give a, a very rough um, um, introduction because I feel design thinking is a very valid, not methodology, but the thought of a methodology to become concrete while you're working on something new. Um, it includes interdisciplinary teamwork, and it is a quite precise process with different steps. Here you see the, the ideal process. Um, what is crucial for design thinking is to define um, a concrete visitor's profile that you can um, develop empathy with. And this concrete uh, visitor's profile should be based on, on the facts, on your audience research, and on fictions, on your empathy, on, on what you think. Um, and what another crucial stack, step of design thinking is the definition of point of view statements. What does that mean? This means to become very cre concrete about a single point of view of an exhibition, of a new software um, uh, development, um, of, um, to become very, what is this about? Um, and to define it in a sentence, one sentence. Um, the next step would be a prototype, develop a prototype. This doesn't mean a very like, um, um, sophisticated prototype. It can be a rough paper-based prototype that you can actually reach out to the, your audience. Go to your visitors, show them what your prototype and get their reactions. Um, there's been a number of, of museums, um, um, mainly the Getty Institute, which works with design thinking quite a lot. In Europe, it's the, the Rijksmuseum uh, um, or the British Museum, who was uh, working on the new uh, wayfinding system. At the Jewish Museum Frankfurt, um, we did the following. We, we defined eight target groups for our new permanent um, exhibition. And we defined them with a method that is called empathy map, which you see on the right-hand side. So we defined them quite precisely. And then we described those targets group as personas, um, which you see um, right down here, which is a rough description of what, um, what is the motivation of a group to come, um, how much time do they have, what do they think, what do they feel, what would they never say they think, um, and, um, and what do they expect? And when will they? What will they? When will they be frustrated? And what will make them laugh? <clears throat> um, and then we defined in our new permanent exhibition. We defined those point of view statements, which means like for every single room in our new permanent exhibition, we have a clear cut one sentence, which is our point of view statement. We will never tell you what this point of view statement is, but we tested it. Um, with, um, with our personas. And how do we test it? And that's the last thing I'd like to tell you about. We tested it the first stop on our pop-up boat. That was a project we did last summer on the river of Main. Um, and that's my team. Um, and we did a pop-up exhibition with core um, items from our permanent exhibition, and there was always a curator on board speaking to the audience about what this item is about, what our new exhibition is about. So we did these sort of curatorial talks spontaneously and planned, and we invited diverse audiences for specific workshops. We did these workshops on specific questions, like for instance inclusion, or like um, gender, gender sensitive language. Um, and so we discussed issues that are crucial for us in the renewal process with our audiences on site. Um, we had two interactive displays on the boat. Uh, one was a quite a broad question, what do you want from a new Jewish museum? And the other one was a very concise question, which was, um, um, how do you think the new square that is going to be built in front of the new building should be named after? After whom? And we invited to, um, the people to vote on the names or introduce new names. And actually, uh, there was a new name introduced, introduced with got, which got the, the most of the votes, which is Bertha Pappenheim. 
Um, well, and as always, we did a microsite and diverse social activities because it was a very social place and so social media played a crucial role. Um, we conceived this board as a platform for contemporary Jewish culture. And so there were lectures, film presentations, uh, concerts, um, discussions taking place every second evening. And this is a small announcement now. This summer we're going to do it again, again as a test lab for our new permanent exhibition. This time we will work with, a, with an art a collective um, from Berlin called Ramlabor and we call it a pop-up monument. It's gonna be a, um, um, how do you call that? A blow-up thing, which you can enter, and we're gonna make workshops on-site with our target groups. Um, we're gonna go do tours around the site to specific um, places of Jewish interest or Jewish places, uh, so to see. And um, it's gonna be a, a platform for contemporary Jewish culture again. Thank you.